So I don't think I've talked about it before, but Regolith was my first experience with a tiling window manager. So I was a KDE guy for the first two years or so of my Linux career, and then I decided I wanted to experience a tiling window manager, but I wasn't quite interested in giving up all the niceties of a desktop environment. And Regolith offered me a solution because basically what Regolith is, is a version of i3 that comes with the GNOME backend, which means that you get all of the niceties, as I said, of a desktop environment. So you get things like the settings application, which allows you to control Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and power management and all sorts of things. Anything you can control with the settings app of GNOME, you can control in Regolith, but it has i3 instead of GNOME. So that's the basic idea behind Regolith. At the time, which was probably about, oh, I don't know, probably about three years ago or so, maybe a little bit longer. At the time, the premise was that you would use Regolith as a learning mechanism to learn a tiling window manager, how to configure it, how to get used to the key bindings and such like that. That was the purpose behind Regolith. It would allow you to be okay with using a window manager without having to give up all of the things that you would if you were to use just a traditional window manager. You'd have all the back-end support that you get with a desktop environment. So that was the claim about three years ago. Now, move to the present, and the premise is basically the same, but the implementation is quite different. So what I wanted to do was take a look at Regolith, and I have over the last four days, I've messed around with Regolith on hardware on my laptop, and I have some interesting experiences. Let's just put it that way. So before we jump into my opinions on everything, let's go ahead and talk about what Regolith is. So as I said, Regolith is an implementation of i3, but with the GNOME backend. So you get a very customized version of i3, but you also get GNOME settings and everything that goes with it. So as you'll see in the B-roll, it functions basically like i3 does. It's a tiling window manager. It has a bar at the bottom or the top, depending on what theme you're using. It has some modules in the bar, and it's fairly customized. And we'll talk about theming and stuff here in a second. But basically, it's i3, but with GNOME settings. And we'll talk about the GNOME backend here in a minute. So that's just the basics of it. So when it comes to the actual i3 configuration, that's where things get a little funky. Especially if you've ever used i3 before, you'll know that i3 is traditionally managed in a single configuration file inside of your .config directory or inside of your home directory. Either or, they usually both work. For Regolith, that's not the case. It's configured in a very odd manner. So first of all, the configuration files are located in your slash user directory which is, you, as you know, is in the root directory, which means that if you want to edit those things, you have to have pseudo privileges. So that's one thing. Second of all, they've split their configuration into many different files. And while that's not unusual, because even I do that for my i3 config, there is some weirdness there. So if you open up those and you see here in the B-roll, a lot of the configuration files have to do with key bindings, first of all. Second of all, the way they do key bindings is they set an X resources variable and then they call the binding. So they use X resources, and we'll talk more about this here in a minute, but basically they use it so that they can easily switch between different layouts and themes. So I have many thoughts on this, and I'll cover those later, but just know that this is not the way i3 traditionally does it. So the configuration is irregular, and I would say not all that user-friendly, but it is well-documented on their website, although their documentation is not correct in some places. And I'll talk about that again later when I talk about my opinions. So the overall configuration of it is a little weird, but if you follow some of the documentation, you probably can get a hold of it. And the main issue that I have with this right now that I'll talk about is that because it's not the same as i3, if you've ever used i3 before, you'll find that configuring this is quite a bit different than configuring traditional i3. So the inconsistencies there are something that we'll see as a theme throughout the rest of this video. Now, one of the reasons why the configuration is so weird is because they've done a lot of work when it comes to theming. So as you'll see in the B-roll, they have eight or nine, maybe 10 themes. Most of they have like Grubbox and they have Nord and they have Solarize and things like that. And they all look very nice. They have the color schemes going for them. 
the bars don't differ all that much. They only have one that is at the top, all the rest of them are at the bottom, but they mostly look the same, just they're different color. So you're not going to get a ton of different, different variation on the bar, but at least they have different color schemes going for you. And they've done a good job of making sure the wallpaper matches and the terminal changes colors. So because they've used that X resources, they've managed to make it so that when they change to a different theme, basically everything goes along with it. Anything that can follow X resources will change themes, and that's actually really nice. Now, as someone who has written an i3 color changing or theming, theme changer script, I can tell you that it's pretty difficult, especially when you have multiple different things that you need to change every time you change to a different theme. So it gets even harder when you use Polybar, which they don't use. So I'm fairly impressed with their theming. I would say that I would have liked to have more variation in the bar, but other than that, the fact that there is theming is really nice. So the themes kind of make up for the oddness in the configuration files, kind of. I'll talk more about that later, but if you really like those themes, at least the weird com configuration stuff makes sense. So if it was just that, it would basically just be i3 with some weird customization. But basically, the whole idea behind this is to give you the support of a desktop environment backend. So if you want to change wallpaper, or you want to manage your Wi-Fi, or you want to ma manage the power settings and stuff like that, in a traditional tiling window manager, all that stuff would have to be extra. You'd have to, as the user, go in and add applications that control those things. So if you want to change themes, you download LX Appearance. If you want to manage your audio, you download uh, Pavu Control or something. You know what I mean? So all that stuff is something that you'd have to do as the user. But with Regolith, because it has a desktop environment backend and spe specifically has the GNOME backend, all that stuff is controlled inside of the actual GNOME settings panel. So you can change your wallpaper, you can manage your power settings, you can manage your display settings, etc. All that stuff inside of the GNOME settings panel, and it works really well. It does integrate well with i3 for the most part. You'll see in the B-roll that at one point I clicked on the multitasking settings in the GNOME panel, and obviously that has no implication for i3 at all, and the settings panel crashed. So they haven't exactly removed everything that can cause some problems, so that's something that they should definitely work on. But the basic idea there is that you can use the GNOME settings panel to do basically everything that isn't controlled by i3. So what I would like to see is eventually for them to work some of their i3 configuration into that settings panel so that if you wanted to do extra configuration but you didn't want to have to mess around with the configuration files you could do some of that configuration inside of the settings panel that'd be really cool uh, but as of right now it's just the gnome settings panel as far as i can tell so that's the gnome settings panel and like i said it gives you the support of a desktop environment in the back end so that you can kind of transition from using a desktop a full desktop environment all into a tiling window manager without losing that support so that's really nice so that's regolith in a nutshell obviously there's quite a bit more that i could have gone into but what i wanted to spend most of this video on was my opinion of it because this desktop environment or this excuse me this distro caused me no ends of problems. So before we jump in, there's actually one other thing that I need to mention about Regolith itself. There's two ways of getting this. One of them is through an ISO, which is uh, you know a traditional way of getting it. You can also install this on any version of Ubuntu or Debian uh, through a PPA or some other method. And that means that if you want to just use a regular version of Debian, you can, or a regular version of Ubuntu, you can, or Kubuntu or Zubuntu or whatever you can. I will say before we jump into my opinion, that they have a very mixed message when it comes to what they are. So the ISO itself is based on Ubuntu 22.04, but they also have a Debian edition. I'm not sure if that's actually an ISO. I didn't check it out, but there is a tab on their website for Debian. So if you'd rather use Debian, you can. And because they have that kind of mixed family there. Some of the things inside of the Ubuntu version are actually saying that it's Debian. So all of the wallpapers are Debian. You'll see the Debian icon in quite a few places. So I'm not sure if they're in the middle of like a transition period where they're moving from Ubuntu to Debian. I don't know. Uh, I do know that Debian pops up in the Ubuntu version quite a bit. So 
now we can move on to the opinion part. So first, let's talk about the good stuff. So if you are brand new to a tiling window manager, I like that that has the GNOME backend as support for you. It works astonishingly well. It means you don't have to add a whole bunch of extra applications to support yourself like LX appearance and power management features and messing around with the terminal and stuff like that. Every Most of your settings that you'll ever want are going to be inside of your GNOME you know, settings panel, so you won't have to worry about that at all. And it means that for new users, you're much more supported than if you were to just hop right into a traditional tiling window manager like i3 or xmonad or dwm or whatever. So that's the good stuff. And it, overall, it worked phenomenally well. Once I got it properly installed, which I'll talk about here in a minute, it worked really well. It worked basically like i3. There is a, a lot of documentation on inside of the actual menu system and stuff like that, so you can get to all the key bindings and stuff like that very easily. And it's fairly easy to pick up. So if you are new to a tiling window manager, it works really well. And as it works, it works well enough for a new user and it works similarly enough to i3 that where if you've used i3 before you could get a hold of it really fast but honestly that good stuff is outweighed by the bad stuff so when i say bad stuff mostly all of the stuff is going to be colored by the fact that i'm a window manager user usually and i have you know opinions on how window managers should work and this doesn't really fit that view and specifically i'm an i3 guy so a lot of the stuff offends my sensibilities and it kind of bothers me. So we're going to talk about that. So first, before we jump into that, let's talk about the website. So if you go to a if you go to Google and you search for Regolith Linux like so, the first result you're going to get is Regolith Linux as you should. And you click on this and this is what I did. Because there's this button here along the side that says get Regolith, that's the first thing that I saw. I didn't pay attention to this, okay? And you really need to pay attention to this. So I got downloaded this, and this version here, if you were to download this and install it, is based on Ubuntu 21.04, which, for those of you who don't know, is no longer in support. That obviously caused some issues. You, I had to do a disk upgrade and ended up at 22.04, I believe, and it wasn't a great experience because things were just broken, right? I mean, it's an old thing. It's no longer, you know, supported by either Regolith or Ubuntu. And it's it was just not a good experience. So I came back to the website thinking, well, you know what? And that, you got to remember, that was after like two days of messing around with it. So I came back to the website thinking that, well, you know what? Maybe, maybe Regolith is abandoned. You know what I mean? And maybe I just did not hear that they were abandoned. So I came back here to see if maybe that was the case. But no... It turns out that this is just the old website, and this stuff shouldn't be used. So you have to click on this to go to their new website. So first, that was my first problem with Regolith, is that I ended up spending a whole bunch of time with the old version, and it makes me wonder why the developers still have the old website up, and why they haven't just used a redirect. Like, why isn't there a URL redirect to their new website? Because obviously their old website and that old version is something that they shouldn't want people to use, but it's still there, and obviously not reading that top heading or whatever is my fault, but still, it seems like a fairly easy thing for people to do is to go right to the button and not read the website. People are lazy inherently, so it, it was just a very stupid mistake for me to make, but also, I'm not quite sure why that website is still up. So that was the first thing that I wanted to talk about. The second thing, and the main thing that I wanted to talk about, is this i3 configuration file. So they rely on x their x resources variables a lot in this and the reason why they do from what i can tell is because of the theming and that's the way they've chosen to do it and there's nothing inherently wrong with doing it that way although i don't find x resources to be user friendly at all and to begin with regolith was supposed to be user friendly it was supposed to be that transition from a desktop environment into a window manager and very easily configured right because this uses x resources it's not as easy to configure as i3 is itself. i3 is a very simple window manager to configure. They've made it much more complicated than it needs to be because of the theming. Now, because of the theming, they have a good reason, but it makes it less user-friendly, less configurable, in my opinion. And it took me a while to get my head around it. When I first saw those configuration files, 
and I had no clue that they were using X resources because in traditional matte fashion, I didn't read the documentation, so I just hopped right in. I found the configuration file, which doesn't exist in the traditional place, but whatever. And, you know, I saw that and it was like, what is this nonsense? Because it's it's not a traditional way of configuring i3. And because of that, it's more complicated than I feel that it needs to be. And honestly, that's my biggest problem with it is that this is a distribution or a whatever you want to call it. If you don't use the distribution part of it, it's a distribution that is meant to be very supportive of new users when it comes to new users to window managers. And if you start with Regolith and then say transition into regular i3 later on, on a different distro or whatever, your experience on Regolith isn't going to translate nearly as well to i3, traditional i3, as you would think it would. Now, there are obviously some similarities, but they're also still quite different. And that's the same for even if you were to transfer to a different window manager entirely. Every other window manager has different ways of doing things, but they're all usually have some similarities. Regolith has a lot more differences than you would expect it to, given the fact that they advertise it as a version of i3. And one of the greatest benefits of i3 window manager is the documentation. And unfortunately, they've changed so much of that configuration file, not only the location, but also the syntax of it, that a lot of that i3 configuration documentation doesn't apply, unfortunately, which means that you're going to rely on Regulus documentation, which isn't nearly as good. It's not bad, but it's not nearly as good as traditional i3's documentation. So at the end of the day, what I would argue is that this is not i3. It is a fork of i3. They've done a lot of work to make it appear like i3, but their configuration files have deviated in such a manner that it's just not as much, it's not as close to i3 as I originally thought. And that's a little bit disappointing to me. Now, as I said at the beginning, most of this is going to be because of my perception of what this used to be. So this used to be, back when I used it, much closer to i3. The configuration files were in the same place as i3. There were still some different naming conventions and stuff like that. They didn't have any of the themes and stuff like that and stuff. It, it just felt more like i3. And when I transitioned to actual i3, a lot of the stuff that I learned in Regolith was transferable. Now, I'm not so sure that if you had that same experience that that would be true. And like I said, that's a little bit disappointing to me. Now, if you go into this expecting this to be a destination instead of a transitory point. So instead of using this as a stepping stone into the wider window manager world, if this is just the place where you're going to go, then this isn't bad. Uh, it's not. In fact, it's not bad at all. But if this is the place where you're going to end, it has a lot of features. It has the excellent GNOME backend for support, and it works really, really well. The configuration file is still weird, but it is learnable. And if you learn more and more about i3, or specifically, excuse me, if you learn more and more about X resources, then you would have a better chance of configuring it to your liking. But learning X resources doesn't really help you when it comes along to learning other window managers because most other window managers don't use it by default. It's used for color management and terminals and some bars, but usually it's not used for key bindings and scripts and the bar and stuff like that. Regolith uses X resources for the bar, for colors, for key bindings, you name it, it uses X resources. And like I said, that is non-traditional. And if that's something that's okay with you, if this is the destination and you put the effort into learning it, it's not that bad. But again, it's it's different. And like I said, it rubbed me the wrong way simply because I was expecting it to be much closer to i3 than it actually is. So that is Regolith. It is, it's a good i3-ish imp implementation. It's not, it's not something for me. Let's just put it that way. Maybe, and I don't think it was built for me or meant for me. It's meant for people who've never used a window manager before, who want that desktop environment support. It's not meant for people who are used to using regular window managers and configuring them like normal because it's just, it's too different. It's too weird. And if that's okay with you, then it's a good thing to use. For me personally, I didn't like it all that much, to be honest with you. It just, I like the traditional way of configuring i3, this one here. I'm not a big fan of X resources, so it kind of, it, it just pushed me 
in the other direction. So that's it for this video. If you have comments on Regolith, you can leave those in the comment section below. You can follow me on Mastodon or Odyssey. Those links will be in the video description. You can support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash Linuxcast. Links for Libera Pay and YouTube will be in the video description. Thanks everybody who does support me on Patreon and YouTube. You guys are all absolutely amazing. Without you, the challenge will not be anywhere near where it is right now. So thank you for so very very much for your support. I truly do appreciate it. I know I said it at the end of every video, but I truly mean it. So thanks for your support. Thanks everybody for watching. See you next time.